Welcome, everybody, to New Evidences for Joseph Smith's presentation on Nephi's wooden bow. Here it is. <laughs> uh, well, something like this, we think, is what he may have made out of a wood called Atom from Saudi Arabia. So let's talk about that, and let's understand, first of all, who Nephi is. Nephi is a prophet from the Book of Mormon that was translated by the prophet Joseph Smith. It tells the story of a family uh, that leaves Jerusalem 600 years before Christ. The father of the family is prophet Lehi, and Nephi is his son. They travel south of Jerusalem to the Gulf of Aqaba, and then they travel along uh, the borders near the Red Sea. Uh, the borders are generally believed to be the mountains near the Red Sea. As they travel southeasterly, down the Arabian Peninsula. And then, at about modern-day Yemen, they turn eastward, and then they go to the shores of the Indian Ocean, where they find the land that they refer to as bountiful, because of its much fruit and honey. So, from there, the prophet Nephi is instructed on how to build a ship and he builds a ship, and the family then travels across the ocean to South America. And they land uh, a little south of the Isthmus of Darien, which is the Isthmus of Panama, according to the prophet Joseph Smith. Now, Nephi kept a record uh, on gold plates. He had two sets of records. One was referred to as the small plates of Nephi, where he kept his kind of sacred stuff. And then he had the larger plates of Nephi, which were to record the history of his people. He essentially is the founder of the Nephite civilization that then dominates the American continent up until 385 years after the time of Christ. Now, Nephi is considered to members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to be a great character of faith. And so Nephi and his story is often told to encourage members to be faithful. And that's part of the theme that we have also for this presentation, pointing out that we can be like Nephi and who overcame his challenges in the desert by turning to the Lord for help. Here you see an area close to the city of Bisha, in Saudi Arabia, up on the escarpment, in the area where we think they may have been traveling. The white mountain you see there is made entirely of quartz. As you can see, it's a pretty barren place. So we're going to talk about uh, this story of their journey. We're gonna start um, up in Jerusalem. Of course, there is Israel. And the family is going to travel down near the Gulf of Aqaba where Nephi has what I refer to as his conversion experience, where he finds out for himself that his father really is a prophet and that God has a plan for his family. They'll then travel down the borders or the mountains along near the Red Sea, down into this area near Bisha, and we're going to learn about Atom, which is a, a tree that is found in that area. Kamis Mushait is where I was living uh, at the time, this would have been in 1998, uh, with my family. And then uh, we're going to continue with the family down into Yemen to a place called Nahum. And then from there, they travel across to the borders or the, the coastline of the Indian Ocean to a place that they call Bountiful, where they then construct the ship. This is just a picture of uh, me and my wife, Pat, and our three youngest children, Elliot, Jeremy, and Alana, and we're up on top of Mount Suda, uh, which is at 10,000 feet, uh, close to the town of Abha. This is one of the uh, royal palaces up there. And so uh, that's just to give you some perspective of what we were doing. That picture was taken in 96. Now, some general things about Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia came into the modern world fairly recently, so things have changed dramatically. As you can see here, uh, Toyota trucks, uh, the small ones and also the Land Cruisers, are just found all over the place, extremely popular vehicles. 
Um, camels, of course, were used for transportation in the past, but now they get the ride. So it's fascinating to see uh, camels being transported in these little pickup trucks. It's a fairly common sight. It's okay to take pictures of men in Saudi Arabia. Of course, they, they would need to give their permission. Um, all of these men in this picture are all Saudis, uh, except for the young man in the back with the blue pants. And so he's probably Indian or Pakistani, uh, what used to be what was referred to generally as third country nationals. We were also, as Americans, third country nationals living in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but there were a lot of them there that uh, provided labor, uh, and so they were all over the place there. Um, previously, up in the mountain areas particularly, and in the area where there was water and oases, homes were made of uh, mud, uh, dried mud, and going into those homes was pretty amazing. It, it provides a nice, cool place to live. Uh, of course, out in the desert, and when they're mobile, they're using uh, tents made of animal skins. But of course, wherever there's water, that yields some civilization. Here's another example of that. Here's an oasis that's at the bottom, at uh, the base of this uh, long escarpment that runs along near the Red Sea. Um, in the north, it's um, not very high, but then as you get close to Yemen, you get up above 10,000 feet. And so it's hard to see the mountain there behind it, but uh, this is a little town that was nestled at the base of the escarpment. Interestingly, it's now completely abandoned, but you can see that rock was used as the natural resource for building uh, that little town. In general, as new technology came, the people along the base of the escarpment tended to move up to the top of the escarpment where it was cooler, um, where they could still get water uh, from pumps and things like that. So a lot of the, there was a big transition in the population up to the higher elevations. All right, so back to our story. So Lehi and his family leave Jerusalem, as I said, about 600 years before Christ. And they travel down into the area of the Gulf of Aqaba. And there is described in the Book of Mormon a, a valley of Lemuel and the river Laman. Uh, interestingly, it's in about the same area as two other very significant historical sites. Al-Bad is actually the site of uh, Jethro's well. Jethro, of course, was Moses' father-in-law. This is where he lived, and Moses fled to this area from Egypt. Uh, also close to there is a mountain uh, called by the Bedu, the Bedouin, Jabal Musa, in other words, the mountain of Moses. Um, we hear about Mount Sinai over here is where the Ten Commandments were received. Uh, that's probably not accurate. Uh, that site doesn't match the scriptures. Whereas Jabal Musa, Musa, when you, and we visited that, uh, it's another subject, of course, but uh, matches the scriptures in great precision. So, uh, interesting historic area there. This is a picture of what may be the River of Laman and the Valley of Lemuel. There have been a number of uh, good books written about um, Saudi Arabia and the travels of Lehi and his family in that area. Uh, this one here is uh, Lehi in the Wilderness by George Potter and Richard Wellington. I actually worked with them to help research what wood Nephi could have used for making a bow, and, and my discoveries are talked about in this book. In addition, uh, there's uh, what they call uh, the Nephi, Nephi Project, and they have some DVDs, this book series called Discovering Lehi's Trail, and on the number two disc, uh, there's an interview of me describing how the wood was discovered for um, the, the research that was done. There's also another book that uh, preceded uh, Potter and Wellington. This was written by Lynn Hilton and his wife, Hope, um, and they wrote an excellent book about uh, the possibilities of where Lehi was as he traveled in the Arabian Peninsula. For example, they've got a great piece in there about the 
Lehianite uh, culture, uh, the Lehian rulers, and and uh, that they appears they practice baptism, they uh, the Jewish faith apparently, uh, and this is along the route that the prophet Lehi went, and the timing uh, of that civilization seems to match also. So there's a lot of interesting things we don't know for sure if this is. The, the spoken of place, the river Laban, Laman, excuse me, is, is really just a trickle today uh, because um, it springs from underground uh, further north. And in that area, there's a lot of um, wells now that draw at lowered the water table and taking a lot of water out there. So what may have been a river at one time or a stream, more accurately in Western terms, I think, is now uh, barely a brook. But what's interesting is that it flows continuously all year round, and, and according to reports, it is the only uh, stream in, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula that flows year round into the ocean. So it was in that area that Nephi has his conversion experience. As I said, we've been in that area. We were exploring at the time Jabal Musa. Uh, the desert there is extremely rocky and barren. Um, you can imagine from the Book of Mormon story why it was that uh, Nephi's older brothers, Laman and Lemuel, were very upset with their father. Uh, they wanted to go back to Jerusalem. They thought their father was crazy. Why would you leave Jerusalem? Here Lehi is saying, no, we need to leave because Jerusalem is going to be destroyed and God has a plan for us. Uh, to take us to another land. Uh, well, Laman and Lemuel weren't buying this. What's interesting is that uh, from the Book of Mormon account, it appears that Nephi, who was younger than them, may have been listening to his brothers and was very sympathetic to their view. This is apparent uh, from this uh, chapter and verse in 1 Nephi, chapter 2, verse 16. As we read that, notice the wording. He's, Nephi says, I did cry unto the Lord. So he obviously had decided to pray and ask God concerning his father. And behold, he, meaning the Lord, did visit me. So here Nephi uh, is very similar to the prophet Joseph Smith. And he, meaning the Lord, did soften my heart. Now that's significant. So there we see that his heart must have been hardened towards his father. He was probably tending to side, as I said, with Laban and Lemuel. But the Lord softened my heart that I did believe all the words which had been spoken by my father. And because of this, wherefore, I did not rebel against him, like unto my brothers. So this is a very, very significant scripture. It is perhaps the most significant event in Nephi's life because here uh, he turns to God in prayer. The Lord visits him and essentially uh, calls him to be a prophet and uh, gives to him the knowledge that his father is a prophet and that the Lord has a great work for him to do. So this significantly changes Nephi's life. Uh, it allows Nephi to later, in fact recorded in the next chapter of the Book of Mormon, chapter three, uh, a scripture which is used very frequently in, in LDS uh, talks. And let me just read that to you. It's 1 Nephi chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, he had received an instruction from his father to go back to, to, to Jerusalem along with his brothers to obtain the records of Laban. And um, the brothers, of course, complained about this. But Nephi says, And it came to pass that I, Nephi, said unto my father, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. For I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them, that they may accomplish the thing which he commandeth them. Well, clearly, Nephi was able to make this statement because he had been converted to the Lord recently. Well, from the uh, Valley of Lemuel, up here near the Gulf of Aqaba, 
The family then travels southeast down the Arabian Peninsula in the vicinity of the Red Sea. There are postulated to be two routes of travel. One is the coastal plain. The other one is the frankincense trail up on the escarpment. Now to clarify, the escarpment starts up here in the north, uh, just a few hundred feet above the coastal plain. But then as you go further south, it gets higher and higher. For example, down in this area is Mount Suda, where we were at 10,000 feet. And down in Yemen, it actually gets a couple of thousand feet above that. And then there's a very uh, steep drop off down to the coastal plain. So there are some arguments uh, for both. Um, I tend to favor, and so does uh, George Potter and Richard Wellington in their book, uh, the, the Frankincense Trail, for a couple of reasons. As you can see, the coastal trail was hot. There were a lot of lava fields there that had to be crossed and would be tough on the camel's feet. Also, so therefore it'd be slow. The advantage though is you're close to the ocean and you can get fish. Interestingly, that seems to support the argument that they were not on the coast because the frankincense trail was up at a higher elevation there, it was cooler. Uh, the terrain was less constrained. They could travel faster in this direction. Uh, it would have taken a great deal of difficulty to get down the escarpment back up again if you wanted to go get fish. So fish wasn't available, not practical, but there were animals at the higher elevations uh, that they were able to get. And we learned from uh, Nephi's broken bow experience uh, when he makes the wooden bow that he then is able to go into the mountain and to get animals. So it appears that it most likely would have been on top of the escarpment that they were traveling. So um, they, of course, uh, uh, the Book of Mormon says that they were traveling in the more fertile parts of the wilderness, which of course were a little few and far between. The more fertile parts of the wilderness were typically in the borders or in the mountains near the Red Sea, because at the higher elevations in the mountains you do get some precipitation, and as you can see from the vegetation there, uh, you've got uh, also areas where you can cultivate. And so you can see these terraced fields, and so there were villages and stuff up along the top of the escarpment, and the area referred to there as the Hijaz, uh, which was actually populated by many of the House of Israel. After the House of Israel left Egypt and went into the wilderness, some of them actually uh, did not all go with Moses up into uh, Palestine, what we call Palestine today, uh, but some of them split off and went down into the area of the Hijaz and populated that area. So uh, there's actually a very strong Jewish history all the way down this coastal escarpment, all the way down into Yemen. But as they traveled, uh, they, uh, they had a crisis of food. And this is um, how it developed. Nephi was using a bow uh, by the way, he described himself as very large in stature, uh, so perhaps that's why he was uh, the one who was using uh, the steel bow, which was hard to pull, uh, but it broke. And so uh, that resulted in a problem. The scripture says that his brother's bows had lost their spring, so those were wooden bows, and wooden bows over time lose their spring, and so they could obtain no food for our families, and they did suffer for the want of food. They, fought, they suffered so much, in fact, that even Lehi uh, began to murmur against the Lord because of the hardness of the situation that they were in. Now, what we want to notice here is that Nephi essentially demonstrates uh, his strong uh, faith and leadership characteristics. Here he kind of takes the lead for the family. Um, he says, I did make out of wood a bow. And therein raises the question, where was the wood that Nephi got to make a bow? And an arrow. And I said unto my father, so he's respecting his father still, uh, where shall I go to obtain food? So then he did go forth into the top of the mountain Okay, so they're already in the mountain. He's describing going into the top of the mountain, or he could have been on top of the escarpment and gone a little bit higher up 
to the edge of the escarpment where the peaks were, and did slay wild beasts, plural, and so that they obtained food for our families. It may be then that those beasts were not very large um, as he returned them to his family for food. We found up there um, a lot of baboons, uh, but also there is also uh, the onyx, uh, which is an antelope, um, that if he had killed one of those, it would have been one beast that he probably would have carried back to his family. Okay, so uh, trying to find out what wood Nephi could have used in the Arabian Peninsula was going to be uh, a challenge. So uh, we needed to have uh, some faith, uh, scripture study, of course, in the Book of Mormon to understand the particulars, prayer, and just plain hard work. Uh, one of the things that uh, I found very quickly is that <clears throat> my sources uh, within the Saudi community uh, were not good enough to be able to determine what wood could have been used anciently for bows. We knew that they used bows anciently, but we also know that they, of course, transitioned to modern weapons, and uh, nobody knew of any bows that were laying around. Uh, the reason why that became known to us later. Uh, also, we uh, did not know uh, what they, most of the guys I talked to did no clue what uh, wood would have been used for bows. We had relied a little bit on uh, Hugh Nibley's speculations as to where the broken bow incident probably occurred. Uh, we also, uh, he had also referred to knob wood. It turns out that knob is the canine tooth. And so knob wood, most of uh, the Saudis I talked to thought it was probably a reference to the, some of the thorny trees that exist out there in the desert areas. Uh, but none of that wood was any good for making bows because it was extremely dry and brittle and not effective at all. So we didn't know where to, what to do other than to perhaps go to the areas that uh, uh, Hugh Nibley had suggested, which are higher up on the escarpment, and start looking uh, on top of the escarpment and down the escarpment to see what uh, trees might be of use. You saw in the picture of me and my family on Mount Suda, Jupiter, uh, juniper tree there. Uh, those, of course, are no good for making bows. And so um, we didn't really have a, a solution in mind as we began <coughs> our uh, exploration. So what we're going to find out here is that in the area of Bisha, between Jeddah and Abha, particularly in the area between Taif and Abha, uh, the, there's an area where there's Atem. Now, Atem is a wild olive tree, we'll talk more about this, uh, but it's found in elevations between five and 7,000 feet elevation on the sides of the escarpment. And in fact, it was also cultivated, uh, it appears in the past, for its qualities. So we'll talk about that. So here is pictured an atom tree. You can see me there on your right and Matt Fortner along with me. And that uh, tree was identified by a Saudi man, I'll explain that. Uh, but the atom tree is a wild olive tree. There were actually uh, little, small little olives on the ground <laughs> that you could pick, but insufficient flesh to be of any use to eat. Uh, so. Interesting though. All right, so here's how we uh, discovered Atom. We, after, after much exploration and trial and error and talking to people, not finding any, any experts, we finally went up uh, to uh, the mountain that uh, you Nibley had talked about that area. And we found a road that then zigzagged down the escarpment. It had literally been bulldozed out of the side of the escarpment. You can see from this picture how steep the escarpment is. And uh, <clears throat> so we came onto this dirt road, and as we came down the escarpment, uh, we saw some uh, trees that looked somewhat promising. So I got up in into those trees, and I was cutting a piece of wood out when a um, Toyota Land Cruiser stopped 
uh, and a, a nicely dressed Saudi man got out and asked us in Arabic, you know, what we were doing and what I was looking for. Um, I don't speak Arabic. Um, I tried to explain that we were looking for Go Swasahin, uh, bow and arrow, uh, wood. Uh, he very quickly detected that I really didn't speak uh, Arabic and so then he switched into perfect English and uh, explained to me that the tree that I was in was the Daru tree uh, and that, that that was not any good uh, that wood was not any good for making bows that the wood would dry and, and break and be very brittle so um, I asked him I said well are there any trees here that are good for making um, bows and he said Atem and I asked him if there were any atom trees around, and he briefly looked around and said, no, but there's some further down the road. And he offered to take us down so we could see some. So we followed him, and he pointed to this tree here. He said, that is atom, and that's good for making bows. Well, there was another tree which is outside of the picture that was actually larger than this, but looked to me to be the same. And I asked him if that was Atom, and he said, no, uh, it's not, and that the wood of it would uh, become brittle and break. Well, um, we thanked him. We started to walk over towards this tree, and it, as we all would do, we turned to wave goodbye to him, and he was gone, simply gone. Uh, there was a curve in the road uh, where, where we couldn't see a portion of the road, uh, but there was no dust or anything. Um, and as we continued to wonder where he was and to look, um, there's the road then come back into view that there was nobody on the road. He was the only one we saw on the road that entire day, except for one vehicle much further down the escarpment that we saw uh, later in the day. Um, and of course, any vehicles traveling on that uh, dirt road were kicking up a fair amount of dust. So it was interesting to us that he knew the names of the trees, he knew their qualities, and when we turned to thank him, he simply was not there. So um, later, I took a look at the tree uh, that I had wondered if it was Atom, and uh, we found a piece of wood on it and it, that was uh, dry, and it simply snapped off. It was obviously no good for making bows. And that by closer examination, we noticed that the autumn tree, the leaves of the autumn tree are green on the top and silver underneath. And this was the distinguishing difference between this tree and the other one. So we called that one false autumn. Now we did find a uh, piece of wood on this tree uh, that had died, that there was no growth on it. <clears throat> and we tried to break it off. It would not break off. We had to cut it off the tree. And um, it is from that wood that I made this bow in just um, less than four hours. What I did is it, it, that piece of wood looked very much like this one. Um, what I did was split it in half and uh, then use the two of the pieces from the halves to make the bow. The Later on, uh, Richard Wellington and George Potter uh, came out to our area because uh, I had provided them the results of what I had discovered with respect to Atom Wood. They wanted to see Atom. And so they came out to our area to uh, look at it, uh, and we arranged a rendezvous in the area of Bisha, and we went out to the edge of the escarpment. We found there at the edge of the escarpment, and this was at a different location than, than this one in the previous slide. Um, this here, uh, we did not go back to this location. We were further north. And in that further north location, we found a lot of false autumn. Um, and so I was a little frustrated as we were trying to find a decent autumn tree for them. Um, they uh, 
needed to camp that night, I had to go back to Camis Mouché, and so uh, we were somewhat perplexed as we tried to find some real Atom. We ended up taking this picture with false Atom because they needed a picture, so we took this one, uh, but as I indicated, it was not an Atom tree. The uh, Sister Holland, uh, interestingly, uh, prayed about the situation as we were fr as I was becoming more and more frustrated. I asked Matt Fortner to go off and to find a campsite that uh, that the guys could use, uh, which he did. And then when he came back, he got us and uh, took us to that location. As we were driving towards that location, uh, sunset was upon us, so we were starting to lose light. I was desperately looking at the trees around us, trying to find a real atom and having no success. But then we arrived at the location that Matt had found for them to camp. And it was underneath the largest atom tree I have ever seen. So uh, Sister Holland's approach worked, you know, uh, praying for help. Uh, the Lord, uh, through Matt, took him to a place where there was an atom tree. So this picture is taken with that tree, and this piece of wood here was taken off that specific tree. And it's a good solid piece of atom, and uh, I'll talk more about the wood and its value here in just a minute. The point of that story uh, is, of course, that we really are no different than Nephi. Uh, we face our crises in life, uh, and we have to work with them and handle them. How do we do that? Nephi, of course, had his crises in the wilderness when uh, his steel bow broke and their wooden bows were no good and he needed to make a bow of wood to be able to provide food for the family. Uh, so he used faith and righteous leadership to overcome that problem. We can do the same thing wherever we live and whatever our challenges are. So that's kind of the lesson that we get from Nephi and this wooden bow. But I'd like to go back for just a minute and talk about Atom. It was later that I was able to find an expert in Arabic uh, culture. There was a gentleman by the name of Dafur bin Hamsan who was setting up a cultural village in the town of Kamis Mushayt where we lived. And uh, so I went over to talk to him and I took this bow with him to find out if he could tell me whether or not this was actually atom wood. And uh, he did an interesting thing. He took a sliver of wood off the bow and chewed it. And he said, yes, this is atom. He then told me what atom was used for. Let me, uh, let me show you here if you uh, look closely uh, you'll see at the end of the piece of wood there, the center is black. What that is, is it's oil. So the wood is heavily impregnated with oil. What Dafa told me was that Atom was extremely valuable in their culture. What the, besides making bows, <clears throat> what they did with the wood is they cultivated it, uh, but they would harvest the wood and then they would boil it down and they would extract the oils from the wood. And as the oils came out of the separator, uh, they would separate with the, into three layers. <clears throat> the black bottom layer was thick um, consistency, uh, kind of like tar, and it was used for uh, waterproofing, uh, kind of like a paint. The next layer was um, also fairly uh, thick um, and it was used as a perfume. And then the layer on the top was much uh, thinner, of course, uh, and lighter in color, and it was used as a skin treatment for any kind of skin ailment. So it was very valuable in their culture. He said that uh, once uh, Modern firearms came along and bows weren't used anymore and they were discarded. But not only were they discarded, the wood <laughs> was put in the processor to, uh, to get the oils out of the wood because uh, those oils were valuable. So that explains Atom. 
Now, I did find at one point also, uh, closer to Taif, a younger atom tree, and I did harvest a couple of pieces of wood off of it. Um, if you look closely at this end, you can see a little bit of the black, but this is a younger piece of wood, and uh, it's not as prevalent. I got into some trouble when I got that one. I didn't realize that tree was on private property, so I got a real chewing out when I went up into that tree and, and cut this piece out of it. But anyway, that's autumn. All right, so uh, in conclusion, uh, we're going to do two things. I want to ask a question, first of all, about uh, the Prophet Joseph Smith um, and how some of the things on the Arabian Peninsula transpired um, and how he possibly could have known about that. First of all, uh, we learned that after the Broken Bow incident, uh, and from the way they tell their story and everything else, we all know that that occurred in this area. Well, certainly there was wood there that could have been used by Nephi to make a bow, and that that wood was available in the elevations between five and 7,000 feet. Some of those further south would have been um, down from the top of the escarpment, such as where we discovered the Atom wood. But further north, up towards Taif, and as you got closer to Jitter, some of that Atom wood would have actually been up on top of the escarpment and would have been available to him. Certainly, uh, from what I was able to do with this, uh, he would have been able to make a bow and uh, be able to use it. And we're going to demonstrate that at the end of the video. So, the question after that experience, though, the family continues to move in the southeasterly direction. And then we read in the Book of Mormon that Ishmael, uh, there were two families that were traveling together. There was Lehi's family, and there was Ishmael's family. Ishmael's family had most of the girls. Uh, it appears that Lehi's family had most of the boys, so you see how that worked. But uh, Ishmael died. And the Book of Mormon says that he died in the place which was called Nahum. And uh, so that's interesting because many of the places they named themselves, but this one was named Nahum. And it was not until approximately uh, the mid 1990s that uh, it was the archaeologists considered that this location here uh, was Nahum uh, from the inscriptions on altars at that location. And so, how did Joseph Smith know about that? There was a German cartographer who had identified a place in this area and named it similar to Nahum, um, but that was in German, and to our best knowledge, that was not available to the young prophet Joseph Smith as he was starting to translate the Book of Mormon. And it wasn't translated into English until much later. So, uh, how did he know about Nahum? Uh, well, I don't think he did. But then it says that they then turned eastward and traveled nearly eastward until they reached the sea. And there they found an area that was lush with vegetation, lots of fruits and honey. And so they called it Bountiful. And of course, there they were able to make a build, a boat that they would then use to sail to the Americas. Well, it's interesting that in this location, there's two locations here along, along the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula where the monsoon rains hit the peninsula and it's the only place where you have that amount of vegetation and lush growth. And so that's interesting. That would seem to match the story also. And uh, I'm not aware of Joseph Smith being that knowledgeable of geography to have known about that either. So these are interesting questions. but. Um, Suffice it to say that, as far as I am concerned, uh, this is another evidence for the, the Book of Mormon. I think it's um, highly improbable that the Prophet Joseph Smith knew some of these details about the Arabian Peninsula um, when he translated the Book of Mormon. So it's my witness that uh, Joseph Smith was a prophet. The Book of Mormon is true. I certainly have found that to be true be of great spiritual worth, and the life of Nephi is very um, encouraging to folks, uh, the faith that he demonstrated. 
the righteous leadership that he demonstrated, how he overcame the problem of the broken bow and was able to provide for his family. So thank you very much for joining us. And now we'll go out and try the bow. Well, good morning. It's a beautiful morning here, and uh, here we're going to talk about the bow and, and demonstrate its capabilities. So this is the proposed bow that uh, Nephi could have made uh, with the autumn wood. Now, you'll notice here that the bow is made in uh, basically uh, four pieces. We have two pieces for each length and they are joined at the middle with another piece that is then bound. Now, Nephi's tools would have consisted pretty much just of a knife and a few other rudimentary things. And I literally took a piece of atom just like this one, and with nothing but a knife, I trimmed it, split it in half, and created the two lengths. Then taking another piece of wood, and binding it with leather. Now, leather, of course, would have been available to Nephi. Uh, the, the bow string itself, I'm just using a piece of uh, nylon string. Uh, Nephi would have used uh, the intestinal leather uh, from an animal, uh, would have most likely what they would have used. And so, um, also another thing uh, that Nephi could have done, and which I did, because the bow already had quite a bit of curvature to it, you can actually steam this wood and straighten it out, giving it therefore more tension. Um, this bow is now 20 years old. So um, it has kind of reverted to its normal shape at this point. Um, I could steam it and straighten it out and make it uh, more tense, uh, but uh, uh, I haven't done that. So as you can see, uh, the atom wood there at the end, you'll notice the dark uh, coloration there at the end of the, uh, the wood. That is oil that is impregnated into the wood naturally. That's on, you can see it at both ends. Here's a close up look at the bow. Actually, uh, had it signed by Noah Danby, who is the, uh, was the actor who played the role of Nephi in the Book of Mormon movie. But uh, Jess, just rough hewing with a knife, quite simple. Hey, let me now demonstrate the bow's capabilities with an arrow. So a fair amount of force sufficient to drive that uh, arrow into the wood. Uh, it would have taken, of course, some practice and skill to be very accurate with it. It uh, certainly shows that you can send a projectile with a fair amount of force. Fair amount of force there. I can't just pull the arrow out of that trunk. I've got to manipulate it to pull it out. But here you can see how deep it penetrated into the wood. And that shot was from about 30 feet. <laughs> 